Welcome everyone to the Sport and Environment webinar. My name is Erica Mueller Chen, and I'll be one of your moderators for the day, representing Sport and Dev. In today's exciting session, we will be exploring questions such as how can sport contribute to tackling environmental challenges? How can the sports industry reduce its carbon footprint? And what best practices exist for grassroots organizations to leverage sport for development and peace to promote environmental education, as well as much more. This webinar is being hosted by the International Platform on Sport and Development, also known as sportindev.org, with support from the Swedish Postcode Foundation. This webinar is part of a larger spotlight initiative implemented by Sport in Dev and the Swedish Postcode Foundation that included a call for articles on this topic with the aim of increasing awareness, dialogue, and understanding. So far, we've received 18 article submissions, which we plan to publish over the coming days and weeks on the sportindev.org website. Thank you to everyone who's contributed so far. The call for articles does remain open until tomorrow, March 31st. So we'll put the link in the chat box and encourage anyone interested in that call for articles to get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. The structure of today's webinar includes opening remarks, followed by introductions from each panelist, and then individual presentations from our panel, followed by a Q&A open to the audience, and then finally closing remarks from the panel. We encourage audience members to utilize the chat feature of Zoom in order to introduce themselves. You can share what country you're joining from. You can also share a link to your LinkedIn profile or any of your work and feel free to connect with one another either in that chat box or outside of it. If you have any questions or comments during the session for the panel, please type those into the chat box. One thing new that we will be testing out is that if any members of the audience wish to share their question or comment verbally by unmuting themselves during the Q&A, you will be invited to do so. And in order to help us know if you'd like to do that, please type with your comment or question whether you have interest in unmuting yourself later. And that way we can give you a verbal cue to do so. Now, some final logistics and reminders before we jump into the session. We do want to remind everyone that the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on Sport and Dev's YouTube channel. We will ask audience members to keep their microphones on mute, of course, unless we invite you to unmute during the Q&A. And finally, we ask that everyone treats each other respectfully in this virtual space. No hate speech or discrimination will be tolerated. All right, well, with all of those notes, we will go ahead and get started. And I'm excited to pass the virtual stage to our co-moderator, Christo, who will be sharing opening remarks and discussing the importance of this topic within the sport for development context. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Erica, for your introduction and also for a very well arranged webinar. I've really been looking forward to today. Uh, thank you also for the honor of making some opening uh, remarks. Uh, my name is Christo. I'm from Cape Town in South Africa. I'm from the Foundation for Sport Development and Peace. Um, I'm actually here because climate change has made such an impact on our sport federations in the Western Cape. I'm a researcher for government and for UWC, the University of the Western Cape, on a longitudinal studies um, or a study on uh, sport and development in the Western Cape. We've been busy for more than 10 years, and I have uh, the privilege of interviewing some 140 plus uh, federations every year in January and February to ask them what is impacting on them and to actually monitor sport and development. So in 2018 and 2019, we had a big drought in Cape Town and in the Western Cape. We were down to 20 and 50 liters per person per day, and we had a day zero planned. Um, it impacted on sport federations and clubs quite drastically. 
Uh, many of our federations, in fact, closed down, especially aquatics uh, that was primarily impacted upon, but also, as you can think, all fields that had to be irrigated. And then that struck us most uh, was actually that all of our facilities by municipalities were closed. So uh, abolition facilities, water for drinking and washing, and then sanitation was a problem. So our junior uh, netball clubs, for example, closed down altogether for the whole year. Um, I would like to argue that it's not only sport and high performance sport that gets impacted upon, but especially sport and development, and I include sport for development in that. In my own country, which is a developmental state, uh, sport for development and sport and development is really embedded in everything that we do in sport. You can hardly separate uh, those interfaces. So we uh, treat sport as an economic sector. Um, we have 2.2% of GDP in our province that sport is responsible for. We also have 60,000 job opportunities that we attribute to sport. So you can think for yourself that the drought and then COVID after that. Uh, in the subsequent two years impacted on us quite drastically. We, in the social sectors, we look at the impact of sport um, on health, um, especially general activity levels that was impacted upon by the drought, also sport and education and training, physical uh, education at school, but also school sport in the afternoons. So we have 180 mod centers for often after school uh, sport uh, for youth at risk. And those in school programs also uh, got impacted uh, upon. The same with uh, community safety and then all our social cohesion programs. Ladies and gentlemen, more than um, half of our sport federations are actually running with programs for women and girls by way of example. Skills development training, awareness programs, and all of those were severely affected. So I would like to argue that climate change have impacted on sport in the Western Cape through the drought. But also, once we start looking around us, we realize the same drought, the same time in Chile, in Argentina, in Mozambique, uh, in Angola, in Madagascar, and in New South Wales, Australia. So it was a whole Southern Hemisphere uh, phenomenon, the drought that we did have in that period. Um, I would like to um, fix our attention to SDG 12 and 13 this afternoon. SDG 12 is about the sustainable production and consumption of all goods and services. It means that each and every one of our sport organization, each and every club has a carbon footprint. Every cricket ball has a carbon uh, footprint and that we need to take care to address those particular issues. It relates to SDG 13, which is about climate change. Uh, that I've just spoken of. And these days, all NOCs, all international federations are expected to have not only sustainable development policies, but also climate change strategies. In our own province, for the federations that I spoke of, we're now encouraging everybody to develop climate change strategies also for uh, future droughts that, uh, that we may expect. Um, and then just a few words uh, on behalf of Sport and Dev. Um, we happen, or I happen to be on the steering board as well. Sport and the environment is big to us. It's big to us this year, especially in 2023. This webinar is a great start to that uh, to this year and to those priorities. But on behalf of Sport and Dev, I would like you to be part of our network, invite you to participate in all the initiatives that we have, the articles that Eric spoke of, but also the new website that will go up shortly. We'd like you to interact and be part of our policy dialogue and our policy advocacy programs that we have on sport and environment. So with that, let's hear what the panelists have to say. It's great to be here with all of you this afternoon. And thank you very much, Erica, for hosting. Over to you. Thank you so much, Christo. Well, I would love to now invite panelist members to briefly say hello, who they are, and why they're interested in this important topic. And so I'll pass it over to Claire, and then each panelist can just please follow. Thanks, Erica, and hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you this afternoon here in London. I've been looking at the chat as Krista was talking, and it's incredible to see people from so many different parts of the world come together around this really important topic. Uh, my name is Claire Poole. I'm the founder and CEO of Sport Positive. So our organization's work is solely to increase action and ambition on climate change through sport. While we talk about climate change, 
in, uh, when we talk about taking action on climate change as part of that, we incorporate sustainability, environmental justice and biodiversity as well. So we're looking at all of the different sustainability and environment facets of that. And um, we host an annual summit called the Support Positive Summit in collaboration with UN Climate and the International Olympic Committee. And um, we put out leagues ranking football, especially based on their environmental sustainability metrics. We host uh, podcasts and newsletters and essentially try and just raise the profile of sport taking action in sustainability. So I look forward to chatting to you this afternoon. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Erica. And, and hi, everyone. It's like amazing also seeing like a ton of people for every part of the world. Uh, my name is Antonio Vizcaya. I'm based in, in Mexico City. I uh, work within 17 Sport. I'm a strategy manager. Uh, we at 17 Sport, we try to actually accelerate uh, the transformation of sport as a force of good. This is something that I like truly believe. I, I, I think that sport superpowers, it's to actually deliver positive like environmental and social outcomes. And I think this sometimes is like heavily overlooked. So actually we want to, to, to help uh, business to tap into the power of sports and being able to actually activate their purpose and to uh, help us to drive like to a positive future. Uh, I think for me living in, in a country like, like Mexico, which is like so uh, close and passionate to, to, to the sport industry, I, I totally understand like the amazing influence that like this, this industry and this sector has. I, I, I totally believe that I think the sport industry is like the best uh, industry position to actually deliver like positive, like environmental and social outcomes and drive awareness and to actually help sustainability to grow within the corporate agendas in, in every part of the world. So yeah, I'm totally excited to uh, just dig uh, about like the role of the sport industry within uh, this specific theme. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Natasha. I'm from Football Foundation, which is a subsidiary of the Corpus Foundation, which is an NGO in the Western Cape, South Africa. Um, and it's an organization that was specifically founded for the purpose of conservation of a unique patch of wild Cape Floral Kingdom and to change the lives of the people who live within the beautiful and wild space. Uh, the Corpus Private Nature Reserve lies within a natural biodiversity hotspot with over 900 plant species uh, that have been recorded. Seven of these plant species are completely new to science and have now been added to the South African National Biodiversity Institute database of known species, insects um, database, um, sorry, institute database of known species, insects, birds, uh, mammals, mosses, lynchings, and more make up the fascinating wildlife web that make the region so captivating the scientists. And so the trick to protecting this area is to share the magic and appeal of nature with children so that those who live closest to the natural space become champions of conserving it. And we found that the best way to attract the attention of the children is through the fun of sports. So I'll be getting more into that a little bit later. Uh, thanks, Erica, for having me. Um, join in on this. It's amazing and looking forward to hearing from everybody. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Shahad Al Mohamed from Jordan, and I am currently the Climate Action Program Officer at Generations for Peace. So, sport is one of our peace building tools where we use specifically designed um, sports based games and activities that integrate um, peer group and peace building education. I think it's important because it promotes a sense of understanding and unity that transcends the divides uh, found in typical day-to-day -day life in conflict communities. And sport like, has the potential to be influential in the environmental movement since it has the capacity to transform the way people view uh, the planet and um, to encourage them to, uh, to be advocates uh, for environmental change. So by integrating environmental considerations into sports programming, we can raise awareness about the urgent need to address environmental issues and inspire action at the individual and collective uh, levels. I'll be talking more about this during my presentation and happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's Nicolo Di Tullio from Italy. I'm um, uh, an IUC Young Leader 2021-2024, and I'm 
happy and proud to be part of this panel and share the stage with all the other panelists. Thanks to sportsandev.org for inviting me. So um, uh, in my role as IOC Young Leader, I am developing a project that's called GOT2 Train, Act and Research that aims, I mean, the, the concept is bringing together sport and science uh, through quality education and citizen science initiatives. Um, I, I, as an athlete of surf life saving sport, that probably a sport not many of you know, uh, I achieved great results. But what I, I, I could um, I could really feel on my skin is that we were to take action for climate change and doing so through sports, in particular outdoor sports or uh, those sports that bring us in closer contact with nature can really help us to uh, spread the knowledge about the, the urgence of um, climate action and at the same time contribute to uh, the progress of science. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student at University Santana of Pisa in Sustainability Management 2, and I'm focusing mainly on sports organic with to collaborate with sports organizations and delivering projects around environmental sustainability. Great. Well, I'm getting even more excited now having received a little bit of a taste of who each panelist is and what they'll be speaking about today. So thank you all for introducing yourselves. It's also amazing to see over 110 participants already joining us. For those who maybe joined in the last few minutes, we invite you to engage with the chat box, introduce yourself and ask any questions to the panel. So we'll go ahead and jump in and I'm excited to kick off our expert panel and I'll I'll just note that the structure, at least for our two presenters, will be a little bit more conversational. So I'll be posing some questions to them and uh, learning from them. So really excited. And we'll start with Claire. So welcome back to the virtual stage. And for starters, I'd love to invite you, Claire, to share how you feel the sport and environment conversation has evolved over the past decades and what priorities different stakeholders have today. Yes, of course. So lovely to be with you. Thanks, Erica. And um, so in terms of the first part of that, so how the sport and environment conversation has evolved. So I would say we've got examples of this work going back 20 or more years. So just as well for the people who are watching and listening, I come at this more from what professional sport is doing. And um, obviously there's a huge amount of effort that's needed at a grassroots level um, and a huge amount of activity happening. And um, but we can't we can't be all things to all people and we find that we can drive the most change at a professional level where we can more easily connect and drive um, these the sort of behavior changes that are needed. So just to set that scene because some people who are thinking about it from a grassroots level might think you know some of these some of these points are less relevant to them and um, so yeah so we can see examples of sport taking action on the environment in the 90s and the noughties you know there was this work was happening and there was a lot of early adopters and um, doing some work i would say in terms of that evolution Probably um, at a mega sports event, events level, London 2012 was probably one of the biggest moments in terms of mega sports events. Putting sustainability as a really visible part of the games. And um, they had a category of sustainability partners. And um, they obviously, the, the work that happened around that mega sport event um, built into ISO 2012, one big environmental management system um, that's used. So we can see that as a quite a large moment in the evolution of driving sustainability in sport. Um, then in the past decade, we've seen a lot of regional work happening. So a lot of you might have heard of Green Sports Alliance in the US or the British Association for Sustainable Sport in the UK. These regional um, and national organizations have been supporting sport around this work, you know, for a long time. But again, it's been in smaller pockets and been more regionally based. I would say it's in terms of the evolution, it has started to rocket in the past five years. And um, so UN Sports for Climate Action Framework was um, released in 2018. So just under five years ago, where we saw a lot of sports organizations starting to make commitments around the environment. Um, and that has started more of a movement. And then in that, in the five years since it's launched, I would say we've started, started to see much more at scale. I think that's, yes, because of the framework. I also think at a societal level, at corporate level, we're starting to see more and more action on that anyway. Um, 
as we've heard from the IPCC reports, these, uh, you know, the crises are getting ever worse around the climate and biodiversity. So naturally, it probably would have increased anyway. But the likes of UN Sports for Climate Action Framework have really helped that. We're starting to see more athletes speak out on it, managers. We're starting to see a lot more mainstream press coverage. So again, the more of that that happens, the more it will evolve more quickly because people know about it, they hear about it, and they're in the, you know, they, they kind of understand it. So that's a brief pricey of the past 20 years. Um, and then in terms of the priority piece, I think um, stakeholder priorities across sport range. They often, have, they, more often than not, they have one or more of these in common. So they're looking to secure the long-term future of their organizations primarily. And um, I think we can all agree that the majority of the sports we love are facing an existential threat if we all don't start taking more climate action. Uh, if we don't have a healthy planet, how can we possibly participate and spectate with sport on it? Um, to make and save money is a priority as well. So often by moving to more sustainable practices, you can save money if there might be some more capital expenditure, but you can save money long term. And we can also see examples of, you know, being aware of these efforts and doing more making sports organizations money. So Forest Green Rovers, who a lot of people will have heard of, is the Greek, what who FIFA called the greenest football club in the world in 2017. Um, they have very openly said that even during COVID, um, they increased their sponsorship revenue by three or four fold in a period of two years because brands want to align with sports organizations that take this seriously. Um, more, more often now, we're starting to see sports organizations prioritizing this because of regulations. So the Bundesliga in Germany have put this into their licensing criteria. If you don't, if you aren't taking certain actions around sustainability, you simply won't be able to participate in the league in coming years. Uh, World Athletics have embedded it as a mandatory sustainability requirement in, their, in competitions it owns or sanctions. So again, it's starting to not just become voluntary in some cases now, and we like, we're likely to see more of that. It will become mandatory. Um, and then the last one to connect with fans. So more and more um, fans, especially we know young people, um, take this really seriously. They see it as an extension of who they are and they want to align and, and follow and, and be connected with organisations that meet their values. So we see sport now understanding that their fan base is going to demand this of them in the future. So therefore they need to take it really seriously. Um, so, yeah, there's a little bit to start off with if that's if that's enough or I can delve into more. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Claire. And thank you also for sharing your perspective and the angle you're coming at, as you mentioned, this larger sports sector and paying attention to professional and elite sports and the importance and the potential influence that that part of the sports sector and industry really has. And now I'm wondering, Claire, in terms of best practices, have you seen any best practices that you'd be comfortable highlighting where the sports sector has reduced its carbon footprint? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, I think in terms of where we are, I was on a, another session this morning and we were talking about how seriously sport is taking this. So while we know there's more action in sport in this area than ever before, we also know we're nowhere near sport is nowhere near where it needs to be in terms of the work in this area. So when we say best practice, is there a perfect model that everyone can follow? Not necessarily, but certainly there's better practices now that are happening. Um, Forest Green Rovers is just a work, an organization you could come back to all day. Um, and they, in terms of reducing their carbon footprint and putting sustainability at the heart of the organization, um, they do that across every facet in the best possible way. So that's probably the closest, I would say, of all the sports organizations that I know, probably the closest to what you're looking at for a, a model that incorporates sustainability in every facet of the organization. But more broadly, I thought, um, I'm thinking what might be helpful in terms of just sort of saying this organization or that organization, where we see sports organizations that are further ahead with reducing their carbon footprint, they tend to have a number of um, commonalities between them. Um, and I'll just highlight some of those. So in terms of sort of where where really 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 good efforts are being made we see the sports organizations working holistically across the entire organization so it's not just one person who cares about it and in their own little silo does good work it's every facet of the sports organization so from a venue or facility from communications from commercial and um, from legal and finance when you have everyone bought in to this work to reduce your impact on the environment you're seeing a, a much higher level of success and um, 
working with partners. So again, especially a lot of organizations we chat to say we care deeply about this area, we want to do more, and um, but we don't have the resource, we don't have the expertise internally, we don't know where to start. So again, if you're in that boat, then if you work with partners who can help you with that work. So instead of having to do it all yourself, ask all of your partners and suppliers, what are you doing in sustainability? You know, how can we how can we work together to do this at scale? So we see, again, the leaders working uh, well with partners. Where you've got leadership buy-in, if you've got someone at the very top of your sports organization who cares about this stuff and makes it a priority, everything else is going to be so much easier. Um, making commitments and embracing innovation, really important as well. So the leaders will say externally, we are committing to this emissions reduction target. We are committing to net zero. And what that does then obviously is put the, uh, you know, puts it to everyone else that that's what they're going to do. And therefore people are going to check in and see how that work is going. It means it's going to stay on the agenda as a priority once they make those commitments. So again, we see that as a big uh, a big indicator of organizations that are reducing impact. Um, and the embracing innovation piece, there's now more and more technologies and innovations that can make this work easier for you, that can help reduce your impact. So starting to embrace innovation and look to other experts to help you is another big indicator. And the last one is just sort of communicating what, what you're doing as well. So the more action we're seeing, the more we need to communicate it. And, and a lot of the panelists, I'm sure, today will underline the power of sport for climate action. You know, what sport has that many other cultural sectors doesn't have is fans, <laughs> is people who care passionately and deeply about their sport or their, their um, team. And again, in terms of being able to communicate with those people to drive change at a societal scale is something that sport does really well and can do really well. So we need to see more of that communication as well. So where we see these sorts of factors, where you see uh, organizations that are further ahead, they tend to have these sorts of um, these sorts of categories in common. Mm, fantastic, Claire. I feel like I'm getting a very quick master class in this topic. So thank you for loading us with all of these quick and important points. And do you have any final comments to close out your insights and maybe highlight the incredible work that you and your team are doing at Sport Positive to support the global sports industry in fighting against climate change? That's a huge, huge topic. So any final uh, insights from your side? Yeah, I think um, just a couple of quick thoughts and I'll, I'll share a little bit about us, but people can find us online. So I won't I won't spend time in this session talking about us. But um, I think the, a couple of points I wanted to get across in this session are just a, a question we're frequently asked is if we've only got limited resource, should we try and do stuff ourselves to reduce our impact or should we try and engage with our fans for them to do more because we've only got limited resource and although we'll try and do both, what's a priority? And we tend to say, you know, both, you need to do both if you can, but in terms of if you are talking to your fans and asking them to change their behaviors or you're driving, trying to drive action externally and not doing anything yourself, in the current climate and the way things are with the media, you will be called out for greenwashing quite quickly. You can't ask people to change their behaviors whilst doing nothing yourself. That being said, the flip of that coin is if we all, as all sports organizations, wait to be perfect before they actually start talking about the work, then it's too late. We're running out of time. So sports organizations need to gauge this and manage it so that they are being credible they're doing the work themselves but also that they are bringing along stakeholders and and fans on the journey with them because we haven't got time to wait so i wanted to get that across and um, people can find out more about sport positive and what we're doing on on our website on social media we're on linkedin and twitter and everywhere so find out more about that but again i just wanted to finish off my um, intervention with a short quote from a colleague and friend of mine david goldblatt who a lot of you might have heard of. He's an author um, and an academic. And I, I read this quote a lot because it, I find it, it reinvigorates me around the work that we're doing. So he wrote in a piece a couple of years ago, sport is a rare cultural space in which people experience the possibility of radical turnarounds and last minute victories. This is precisely the emotional and psychic space that the climate movement requires if it is to break down the walls of cynicism that block collective action. And I come back to that all the time because I think that 
to me in those like 25, 30 words is exactly why sport plays such a huge role in, in the climate crisis and what we can do. So I hope people take away from that and you should look at David Goldblatt's work anyway, but that to me is a real anchor about why sport is such an important part of this work. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Thank you so, so much, Claire. And I'll now invite Antonio to the virtual stage and he'll be teaching us more about the brand and sponsor perspective of this conversation and their role in sustainability. And so Antonio, welcome back. And perhaps for starters, I can ask you how you feel brands can inspire sports organizations to integrate sustainability into their core values and practices. Thank you, Erika. And, and I think, I don't know, and, and I, I think this like falls nicely after like Claire's like intervention, because I, I do believe also that like the word sustainability within the sport industry is like becoming like a mainstream after the last like couple of years, we still like have like a ton of work to do, but I, I totally believe that we are like moving forward. Hopefully we can actually move like faster, but I think we're we're like moving at the end. Uh, and and I know that even though that there's like a ton of like stakeholders that play like an amazing role within the sport industry and more so within environmental sustainability, I totally think that brands have like an incredible power, and this is something that we we all should focus on because. I do believe that sustainability and more so when, when we are talking about like environmental sustainability, which is like very technical and very scientific and we need to have like a ton of capabilities. I think brands with their resources, with their influence, with their know-how, they have like an amazing uh, role to play within the sport industry. So I think it's important to tap within, within this specific uh, space. And I do believe that there's like maybe three key things that like brands should consider when actually doing something within the sport industry around sustainability. And I think the first the first thing, and, and, and this is also related to uh, Claire's intervention about like uh, avoid greenwashing, it's to lead by the example. So at the end, irrespective to the message that actually brands actually want to like to share or to deliver using like the sports platform, they need to be actually conscious on how they're actually activating and how they're actually moving forward their, with their activities within the sport industry. This is something that we are actually trying to uh, like to develop and, and to work within brands within 17 sport. So we actually want them. So for, for those brands that actually currently have a specific partnerships within the sport industry and they're actually going to activate their own benefits with, I don't know, like many activations and campaigns and we know that they have. We want to actually help them to do like these activations in a more sustainable manner because I think for, I don't know, for some, some brands that are like actually new within the space of the sport industry, they forgot that they're now like in the spotlight. So once they actually do an activation, they don't realize that now millions of millions of people are actually seeing that specific activation. So they need to be aware that they are going to be scrutinized and they're going to be held accountable for that specific activation. And sometimes we see campaigns trying to deliver like, I don't know, like an environmental message. And because of the way they actually deliver that specific message, they are now like accused of greenwashing because they overlook the specific items within that specific activation. So I think one key thing, it's like leading by example. So brands need like internally to try to work within sustainability. So brands should actually have like their own strategies, their own like specific goals and standards for them to actually be considered like a sustainable brand. And also when actually working with sport organizations, they need to be able to actually implement like best practices. So when they actually do like this ton of activities within, I don't know, like a specific games or events or I don't know, whatever activity they do within the sport industry, they do this actually are respecting and following like international standards around sustainability. So I think that's maybe one and one that it's like very important and sometimes it's like overlooked because we talk about like the specific message that they deliver, but sometimes we do not see like uh, the ways and the specific method they use to actually deliver that message. So I think that's one thing that it's like very, very important. The other thing it's like the sponsorship standards. I think that this is becoming um, a little bit like a bit more common in, in in the last couple of years but now we are seeing brands like being announced as the official like sustainability partner of a specific sports organizations so they actually join the sport industry to actually uh, provide a specific know-how or technical knowledge 
to help like the sport industry or the sport properties of like, or I don't know, sport organizations to actually being able to move a bit faster within their own like sustainability journeys. So I think uh, brands actually joining within the sport industry and actually announce themselves as the expert within sustainability is key way to actually help uh, sport properties to advance within sustainability. But also they need to actually uh, like you at like perform like a due diligence to sport organizations to being able to understand if that specific sport property in which they are going to invest actually uh, fulfill with like basic uh, environmental sustainability standard. And I think as this specific practice is growing within the sport industry, this is going to actually push sport organizations to adopt because at the end they need like or, or or the whole like sport ecosystem need the resources of of, of brands they would need to actually uh embrace this specific this specific standard for them to being able to actually keep receiving like resources from brands and this is something that we're seeing i don't know within the investment space we know that the esg uh, elements are becoming more and more common for investment firms to actually position money within within companies and i think that this this is something that it's going to happen also within the sport industry because as brands are going to actually put money within the sport within the sport organizations they know that they are going to be much more uh, visual and they need to be aware that if they actually put money with within sport organizations that are actually no like fulfilling a specific sustainability standard they may be like going to be accused like, I don't know, for, for, for wingwashing or whatever, like specific things. So they need to be, uh, they need to be uh, careful on that. And I think on the third like theme, I think brands and sport properties need to work together to tackle the specific problems. And this is something that we are also seeing more and more. And this is something that we also try to accelerate within 17 Sport. So at the end, it is not just like a brand, it's going to actually enter the sport industry just to like raise awareness or to gain like more like brand awareness or like brand like uh, value but we, we want to see actually brands partner with sport properties to tackle a specific problem so if we are seeing i don't know like a company uh working around the the food ecosystem how they can actually work within or with a specific sport uh, properties to actually tackle the food problem in specific countries so they can actually provide this know-how and this like amazing influence and capabilities to help the sport industry uh, understand a bit better this problem and actually uh, work uh, together to, 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 to solve these specific issues. So I, I, I do think that maybe these are like the key things that I, that, that I think are like very relevant for brands and when they're working with sport organizations. Fantastic. Thank you, Antonio. That's a lot for us to be thinking about, and especially <laughs> for you. folks like myself coming more from the grassroots. It's really educational to, to have that perspective, the brands and the sponsors. And on that note, what about the sponsors? What role, Antonio, do you feel sponsors specifically play in raising environmental awareness within the sports community? And I also feel like this question ties in nicely to a question in the chat box uh, from John, who also asked uh, what interventions can be employed through sport to create educational awareness on climate and so that's hopefully what we'll be answering this whole hour but what about that uh sponsor perspective yeah i i think it's like totally related with with the first like question because at the end i think we need to to move far beyond like the just awareness piece so we need to like just i don't know stop saying that we are trying to deliver like an environmental message and try to actually be uh authentic and to be like uh, really, really, really accountable for the things that we are doing. So sponsors, so actually sponsors that have like a ton of benefits within the sport industry and they are doing like a ton of activations, they need to be mindful on that and they need to be aware that they need to actually use that specific benefits in a sustainable manner. So instead of if they have like a ton of uh, like VIP guests joining the specific events maybe they should avoid actually having those guests in private planes so they need to actually consider every single aspect or, or of the activation and be mindful that if they are going to deliver a specific impactful message and that could be like socially or, invite, or, or environmentally conscious they need to be aware on how they actually deliver in that specific message and i think this is sometimes again this is usually overlooked because we focus a lot in the message itself, but we are not actually considered how the activation is doing. So if we see like a match 
they experience within a specific game. We do not like, I don't know, we do not go into the detail on how actually happened around that specific game. And I think we should be mindful of that. And the sponsors need should consider and develop and look for best practices on how they actually can activate uh, the specific uh, benefits they have within the sport industry. Great. Well, any final insights, Antonia, from your side or your work at 17 Sport that you'd like to leave the audience with? Yeah, I, I think for me, again, I, I, I totally believe that uh, being able to deliver positive like environmental and social outcomes it's the true superpower of sports. We need to we need to more and more businesses to actually join the sport industry to try to tap actually in that specific power to just like uh, avoid try to gain brand awareness, but actually work hand in hand within sports organizations to try to, 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 to tackle a specific uh, global social problems. I do believe that this is the most important platform we have. And if brands actually uh, decide to use it, they are going to, to, to see like an amazing benefits, commercial and also like impact benefits. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Antonio, for your insights. It's really interesting and helpful to hear about that perspective. Mm -hmm. And now I will pass it over to Natasha to share her screen and her presentation. And as she gets set up, I will just kind of verbally transition us because we've started out with Claire and Antonio who bring incredible insights about the sports industry, sports business, elite sports, and then brands and sponsors. And now we're moving closer to community. And so I think Natasha is the perfect person to educate us on the role of an NGO and how an NGO can develop programming to really address this key topic and educate youth and community members on the importance of the environment. So with that, Tasha, over to you. Thanks so much, Erica. So yeah, we work in the community and we work for kids with kids. And so our big question always is, is can children change the way that adult world works? So can children better protect our shared planet that the adults in their lives have done? Uh, Greta Thunberg has taken a stand against the damaging actions of the adult world on the planet by focusing her energy on high level policymakers, but there are other ways to achieve change, change along, along with Greta's with... style of activism. So if children grow up sharing a set of conservation values uh, that shape their choices and decisions, this will enable children um, to then indeed shape and protect our world and our nature through every move that they make. So with the Corpus Foundation, uh, it was founded in 2003 with the, sorry, let me just move to the next slide. So it's not sliding with me, there we go. So the Corpus Foundation uh, in 2003, but then the Football Foundation was started in 2008 with capturing the attention of the children through sports development. Um, and so what started as sports development program using the appeal of football to attract children, the sports field has now grown into a multi-sports program uh, that uses fun outdoor games, sports and coaching to offer a wild range of other programs, uh, life skills and educational opportunities to children. The initial catalyst for the sports development, um, or should I say the Football Foundation, was the 2010 World Cup, which was hosted in South Africa. And the Kruipos Foundation gives children and teenagers something to work towards and hope to prevent them from falling into um, patterns of poor behavior and uh, go into the social ills. So the sports development programs um, around Africa, the continent, and the world have shown time and time again that it is the fun of sport that attracts children. And it is also the um, teenagers initially. So it is unexpected benefits of the education, life skills, motivation, the pride, teamwork, positive role models, positive peer groups, female empowerment, and more that motivates teenagers to become engaged adults. So our aim at develop, discovering or developing elite sportsmen and sportswomen, the vast majority aim at using sports as a tool to improve the lives and the futures of the majority, most of whom will not grow up to be elite or professional athletes. So our focus is on the biodiversity through landscape levels. So what our program is, we've got an Earth Rangers program, and it is using sports to show youth how to care about the planet. 
Um, so many of our marginalized youth live within impoverished communities, have little to no access to nature and the natural environment. So to create an opportunity for youth to learn more and interact with nature, the Kuripos Foundation, we launched what was called the Dibanisa Educational Environmental Education Program in 2011, uh, which focused on Fainbos and marine ecosystems. And then the Food for Sport program, which focused on urban culture as a way of creating healthy minds and bodies by supporting school, vegetable gardens, and creating vegetable boxes for children to grow their food. And then post COVID, we combined the curriculum of these two programs to form one program incorporating the marine and fanbos environments linking to food security and sustainability and job opportunities within the fanbos environment. These programs serve as building blocks to encourage youth to look at their surroundings um, through different eyes and recognizing the opportunities of becoming uh, active citizens who are responsible for the looking after the community and the environment. We've also attach new programs. Uh, so this is called our biodegradable and disposable sanitary pads for our young women in sports and in our community. Um, because again, within our community, something as something as simple as sanitary pads, which is not accessible for our young women. And when they are getting it, it is blocking. None of them have proper, uh, what is it? Um, toilets, the system, those things. And it generally ends up blocking in these rural communities. So we've partnered with an organization called Menstruation Foundation, where they have access to this vending machine, they get a coin and they get this biodegradable and disposable sanitary pads, which is good for them as well as good for nature. Um, because our whole aim is protecting the Cape, um, the Floral Kingdom. And so through the landscapes and protect, we feel that the community, the landscape will then give back to the communities that we live in. So the programs we deliver is the Corpus Food Foundation delivers free sports development programs, feeding scheme and food security, support to ECDs, educational and vocational training, life skills training, career guidance in the green economy, enterprise development, conservation science and research, and then landscape and level conservation as well. And through those programs, so this is the area that we're in. And so with the science part and the vocational training and all through all the collaborations as well, this is what we focus on is 20, 21,800 hectares conserved, 400 hectares cleared of alien invasive plants, seven new plant species discovered, 22 Green Features College graduates in 2022, and then 300,000 pinned insects and 38 active camera traps. And the camera traps is used with the area circled, so just to see with the reforestation of the area, what animals and things have started coming back into the area once it's been protected and preserved from having any other buildings onto it. And then for the social part of it, it is the sports program, the communities. So we've got some direct sports benefit beneficiaries, um, high school, earth rangers, meals, biodiversity stewards, eco, hospitality graduates, horticulture graduates, and 35 small business grants and social employment funds for 31 green interns. Yeah, so that is the Corpus Foundation, social environment and impact through sports. So most of our focus is everything that we do needs to have a green theme and go through all the programs that we do so that the kids, the community and everyone benefits in preserving the area around them and continue to look after nature and preserve so that generations thereafter can continue to enjoy the beautiful surroundings that we are. Um, yeah, so I hope that covers most of it. If there's any questions, please feel free. Erica, I hope that was enough. <laughs> yes, amazing. Thank you, Natasha. And just one quick follow-up question from your perspective, Natasha. I'm wondering if there's one key insight or one key thing that you have learned or the Football Foundation has learned about how to do this work well, about how to blend sport and environment. Is there anything that comes to mind that you feel has allowed the programming to really flourish in the community? Yes, I definitely say. I think what has worked is that 
sport we used initially to attract the kids and get the kids and the, the caring adults that's on the field that they trust and things and then motivating on just taking them on these little excursions and having them be embraced in the environment. So not just telling them about it, but having them visually see uh, the beautiful forest, the rainforest, the rainforest, the milkwood forest, you know, having them go into the beach. A lot of them, although we are situated on the coast, have never been to the beach has never been. And so just exposing them to the, to what is around them and, yeah, and to, so most of our environmental programs as well as excursion based and it's dropping them in the area. So we're learning about the fauna and the flora of the Fainbos, but then also being in uh, the middle of the Milkwood Forest, witnessing what they are, looking at an Erica Regulatus, looking at a Restio, looking at, uh, you know, the plants that are there. It's sitting with our conservation team and looking at the pinned insects and getting more information. So. What we found is that it's not just a classroom-based environment, but once the kids go on these little excursions, because most of them are in rural towns and don't really get exposed to this, but the opportunity of being able to visibly be part of it, uh, visually seeing everything, and then being able to, what is it, touch, feel, and be part of nature that works because then it creates a hunger for kids wanting to learn more, wanting to see more and then wanting to be part of it more. So then you've got a lineup of kids afterwards going, coach, coach, me next, me next, me, coach, where's my paper, me next, you know? And so it's those things, it's just, I feel it's more about, they believe it when they see it. So it's not just us giving them some facts about what the plants are, but actually taking them into nature itself and showing them this is what it is, having them be part of controlled burns and then seeing the after effect, being part of alien clearing, being part of reforestation and planting these plants, um, taking them to the beach. Uh, we've got a new program that is pending um, and will be starting at the middle of this year, which also focuses on ocean conservation, where the kids will then be introduced to uh, investigating and rock pools like inquiring about what is happening in our little rock pools along the coast and how important they the ocean conservation plays into the community as well so it's on ocean conservation as well above our nature conservation Amazing. Thank you so much, Natasha, for your presentation and your insights. And as we invite Shad to join the virtual stage and share her screen, I just, I just want, want to emphasize how incredible the work that Natasha and the Football Foundation are doing. I was privileged to work directly with her in South Africa back in 2013. And many of the programs she mentioned, including Dibanisa and Food for Sport, were shortlisted by Beyond Sport Awards for the environment section. So uh, not that awards are everything, but getting that recognition, I think just goes to show that those programs are global leaders in this space and just wonderful to hear those insights. And with that, let's move to Jordan and to Shad and Generations for Peace and learn how environment functions in that unique setting. Hi again. So uh, today I'll be talking uh, more about the bottom up approach and uh, some of our youth climate action in Jordan. So to start off, uh, I'm working at Generations for Peace, which is uh, a Jordan-based global nonprofit peace building organization. And uh, we are dedicated to sustainable conflict transformation at the grassroots. And we work to empower uh, volunteer leaders uh, to promote active tolerance and responsible citizen citizenship in communities. Um, we, we use carefully facilitated sport-based games, art, advocacy, dialogue, empowerment, and media. Uh, for the Jordanian context, um, while Jordan actually is considered to have a low contribution to climate uh, change, it has uh, or it endures many of uh, its impacts, and um, people across um, People across Jordan are at risk of uh, facing lifelong environmental impacts of climate change, including water and food security, health effects, and livelihood security. Uh, the thing here is Jordan ranks the third in water scarcity in the world, so um, the, the impacts of climate change is, uh, is real. Um, so what we are doing uh, in Jordan? So we launched a pilot program last year, Youth Climate Action Program. 
And uh, it followed the logic from climate sensitivity through climate literacy and climate responsibility to meaningful climate action. How, this is, how, how does this work? Um, we start off by an advocacy for peace training, advocacy for peace training in climate action, uh, where we select um, youth, um, we select youth leaders from all governorates, so to ensure representation across all Jordan. And uh, our youth, those youth leaders, they um, implement the activities and they are called the implementation team in our program. Uh, so when I talked about the bottom-up approach, we, we employ community needs assessment in our program. What do we mean by the community needs assessment? Uh, the community needs assessment, uh, we conduct it to uh, document and um, the, like to document the needs of uh, the communities uh, in relation to climate change. So the youth leaders we selected across all the governorates, they conduct this community needs assessment and uh, they cover the types of uh, climate change issues uh, that they are encountering in their communities. And uh, what do we do with these findings of the community's assessment? We use them to plan the advocacy events that will happen in the community, uh, the events and other community activities. So to ensure that the issues and everything comes from the community itself and then to the community itself. Um, afterwards, so after the community's assessment and after we have came up with all the issues, our youth leaders and the implementation team, they implement ongoing activities within the community. So the ongoing activities include um, ongoing campaigns and advocacy actions. And they provide avenues uh, to share uh, key messages and calls to action related to climate action. And uh, these ongoing activities are delivered to uh, target group members within the community itself that the youth leaders select during the program. And, uh, and the outcomes uh, of the ongoing activities, we use these outcomes to uh, conduct advocacy events and community engagement activities. So this is the important part, is that we don't only ensure uh, including the target group members within the activities, we also ensure other key stakeholders in the community, such as um, uh, community leaders, um, schools, and, and other key stakeholders. So during this this, this program, we um, we conducted around 12 youth climate leaders and target group-led community engagement activities. And the participating target group member I mentioned um, earlier, uh, they, they always have the opportunity to organize such activities in their communities, and that they could foster and reinforce the knowledge and the skills they have gained during the ongoing activities, which is uh, the advocacy uh, for peace. Uh, and I'll be sharing a few examples from the community engagement activities that happened over the past um, few months, uh, one of which is uh, uh, the community activity that happened in Karak, which is a governorate in Jordan in the south, uh, where youth planned an environmental day at local school where multiple activities took place, raising awareness on climate action issues in Jordan and in their own community. Um, we also have uh, another one in Aqaba, uh, which is also in the south, in the far south of Jordan. And this initiative um, where, where um, youth leaders, uh, along with target group members and beneficiaries from the community, decided to clean the beach and parts under the sea as well. And the plan was to use what they collected for recycling and upcycling to create some artistic works and present them uh, at the youth center. Um, we also have another example of a community engagement activity that has happened in the north part uh, of Jordan, in Balqa, where the goal was to raise awareness of hydroponics and benefits it could bring to the youth community. They held a workshop in collaboration with local initiatives to advocate for hydroponics, and then they did a practical activity where the participants were engaged uh, in implementing this um, method. So moving on from the uh, program itself, uh, we also host a local conference of youth. So the local conference of youth is, um, is an event organized by YONGO, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the goals of these uh, conferences uh, are to provide venue for uh, young climate action leaders to uh, provide input to international conferences. So the youth, uh, some of the youth who participated in the local conference of youth 
we're also able to participate in the conference in the regional conference of youth and then to the conference of parties the conference of parties uh, they um, they participated as the official youth delegation from jordan uh, and participated with um, various events and activities uh, they met with decision makers and they delivered um, the jordanian youth voice when it comes to climate action during the um, the conference of party and currently we're working on the second phase of the program we will be kicking off uh, by the end of uh, by we'll be kicking off by the beginning of next month and uh, we're looking forward to implementing more activities and engagements within our communities across jordan so thank you everyone Fantastic. Thank you, Shad. And I just have one quick follow up question for you, if you don't mind. I'm wondering if you have one piece of advice that you would share with other sport for development organizations who are interested in incorporating climate action into their work. And uh, while you come up with your answer, I'll just mention that you already highlighted the importance of community needs assessments. Of course, we're talking about bottom up approach, uh, the importance of building capacity of youth leaders and then community engagement. So for anyone uh, who missed that, you know, rewind it in the recording and, and take notice of those different pieces that make up Generations for Peace in this climate action piece. Uh, and with that, what advice do you have for us? I think one prominent advice would, uh, would be that, uh, that the, the change would come from within the community itself. So, so uh, as the title of my presentation says, bottom-up approach, like we have to focus on including community members in the design of programming including youth in the design of programming gender lens so it's it's all about inclusion and diversity within our programming and our design fantastic advice thank you shad and while uh nicolo gets ready to rejoin us i will just start to reshare my screen in a moment and nicolo whenever you are ready go ahead and start your piece please hi erica thanks again um yeah i'm going to be the the the, the last uh, panelist for this amazing group and i think the Previous ones, and what, what I'm going to do is like to, to wrap up, and uh, I'm going to address quite a wide topic. That is, what I'm what I'm dealing with with my research topic as a PhD student that is the relationship between sport and environment. So in this case, I will only address the direction of the two of the interaction between sport and environment. The, that is the one going from sport to the environment, but we always have to take in. Um, uh, to, to remember that, uh, to keep in mind that there is also the inverse relationship, so that, that also the environment has an impact on sport activities. And therefore, sport activities, uh, guidelines, rule books has to adapt to this change. But in this case, we'll just focus on the, on the first, on, on this direction from sport to environment. Um, during my studies and through my experience, I could sum up some opportunities for addressing the environments in and through sport. So in the sport industry, but also through the sport. So those are uh, promoting sustainable practices. That is like the most straightforward and uh, very direct one. That is the real uh, great assets of sport organizations. So sport organizations and teams or clubs can adopt sustainable practices in their operations such as reducing their carbon footprint, using renewable energy sources, and surely reducing uh, waste generation, uh, generation and production and consumption. Um, very connected to this topic of promoting sustainable practices in sports organizations and clubs, there is the topic of raising awareness, outreach and advocacy. So sports events can be used as a platform to raise awareness about environmental issues and educate fans, players, coaches, and so on, on how to reduce their environmental impacts. For example, sport events can include information on sustainable transportation options, waste reduction, energy conservation, but also partnering with other NGOs that can help and implement those uh, touch points they cannot, they, they cannot reach naturally. 
I mean, partnership is really important in terms of raising awareness and, cre and creating engagement with communities. Um, the third point I'd like to briefly uh, go through is green infrastructure. So also sports facilities can be designed and built with the environment in mind. This can include features such as green roofs, rainwater harvesting, renewable energy systems. So this is more a technical and engineering uh, or architectural part, but also in the process of designing new interventions uh, in urban centers or cities, we can and remember to adapt uh, already existing infrastructures uh, with the environment in mind. Uh, in this sense, athletes and sports organizations can use their platform to advocate for environmental policies and initiatives that promote sustainability. Uh, so also athletes and sports organizations can be part of this process of adaptation or uh, driving the changes in our cities uh, to a more uh, design of infrastructures with the environment in mind. Then they can also promote sustainable products. Sport equipment and apparel can be made from sustainable materials, such as recycled plastic or organic materials, even better. Finally, there is more broader approach about ecotourism, that is sustainable development through sport, um, sport events, uh, activities, sport activities in general, leisure time, out the outdoor time can be designed to promote eco ecotourism, such as nature-based sports, hiking, swimming, kayaking, open water swimming, and so on can really be a driver for sustainable tourism or more sustainable tourism if properly designed and well-built in connection with uh, local communities. There are many opportunities for the sport industry to contribute to the protection of the environment. And I believe that this is a very important topic uh, we should focus in the future. So also territorial development through sport. I know this is quite a list. <laughs> I mean, uh, I went through many, I wanted to chat, touch base with in, in, in many topics I'm, I'm working on and I'm trying to, to focus on in my daily practice as uh, practitioner collaborating with uh, sport organizations, um, but also as a student and researcher in my PhD role. But if I may add, I'd like also to touch base on another uh, topic that sportanddevelopment.com raised, sportanddev.com, sorry, or sport and development raised in this occasion, that is sport and democracy. Um, also um, mentioning my IOC Young Leaders Program project that is GOT2, uh, that is about science and sport. And I found that citizen science approach is a powerful tool to increase. I hear someone, but. Yeah, okay. Here I'm back. <laughs> uh, so what I was saying is that my IOC Young Leaders Program project got to is about science and sport. And I found that citizen science approach is a powerful tool to increase the participation of athletes in fostering a better world. That is the, the reason why the IOC Young Leaders Program exists. Sports people science, we could call it, is a kind of democratization of science. I mean, everyone can contribute to to the, the progress of science in somehow people that uh, acad academians can climb down from that ivory tower of academia and come closer to sports people and citizens so citizen science sport and democracy have a strong interconnection and this relationship can be harnessed for positive change uh engaging uh Elite sports people, gathering data with them, finding leisure sports people and, you know, people just going for a run in the weekends and they can detect which species is around of them, uh, uh, animalities in, in migrations or the raise in temperatures. These can be really a strong way to bring everyone inside the process of fighting and contributing to climate change 
uh, mitigation and adaptation through sport. Thank you so much, Nicolo. And I'll pose one quick follow-up question to you and then I'll talk a little bit so you can think about your answer. Um, from your experience, I'm curious if there are any practical ways or practical tips that you would advise other students or athletes around the world to contribute to this environmental movement and climate change mitigation. So kind of the role of students and athletes in that. And uh, as you're thinking of your answer, I just want to uh, compliment you on being an excellent Excellent closer because I feel like you brought in so many interesting hats as a PhD researcher, as an athlete, as an IOC young leader, and also reminding the audience of the importance of science in this conversation and also the importance of democratization in this conversation. I think it's a really nice uh, conclusion to this excellent panel. So pass it back to you for any final thoughts. Thanks, Erica, for the question. Actually, it is. No, easy. I think there is no solution that fits for everybody and for every situation, but the general, um, maybe, um, let me say, inspirational <laughs> advice I can, I can provide to students, athletes, or young, uh, those from the young, younger generations who want to contribute in this sense, is to try and do not be... Um, do not get scared from what's out there because I know it seems sometimes it's, it seems very difficult and it is way bigger than we are but just move the first step and then you try to 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 move the second one and so on probably you will fail surely you will fail but are those fails that will help you uh, move forward so I mean it's about trying and failing <laughs> and successing. <laughs> mm, realistic advice. Yes, we're all going to fail in the beginning, but even as Claire mentioned at the start, it doesn't need to be perfect to be contributing or to be trying to do something positive in this conversation and in this movement. So thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. So now we'll transition a little bit. We have around, um, oh, I think someone's writing on the screen. I didn't even know that was possible. So please stop <laughs> if you can. Um, now we'll move into the Q&A part of the conversation. So for anyone who has, um, let me just reshare my screen and to make it clean, hopefully. Uh, for anyone who has questions for the panel, please go ahead and type them in the chat box. And we also invite anybody who would like to speak speak out their comment or their question to do so. And in order to let us know that you'd like to do that, please either raise your hand in Zoom or let us know in the chat box that you would like to come off of mute. Um, and so I do know that there, all right, we've got at least one hand raised, so we'll get to you in just a second. Okay, we've got multiple. Uh, Vitas, you're actually the person I was going to go to first. So in just a second, if you'd like to unmute yourself, that'd be perfect. And I'll just give a heads up that I think this question is coming to Claire and Antonio. So Vitas, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Erica. Um, and yes, this question is coming to Claire and Antonio. Um, I was wondering, how can sports organizations, and the best example in this case would be football clubs, be pushed to move away from high emission sponsors? Um, you know, we see a lot of football clubs with sponsors like Emirates Airlines, Qatar Airways, or cruise sponsorships, things like that. And then the second part of the question is, is there a way for sports organizations to transition to green sponsorship without losing revenue, because obviously that is their big money maker and they probably won't do anything without that kind of incentive. Antonio, do you want to go first with the brands person and I'll feed in after? Yeah, I th thank you, Claire. I think for me, and, and, and one of the key things was like the second part of the question. So besides like just saying how we can actually face out like uh, high like emitters for, for actually being able to sponsor sport properties is how we can actually bring more sustainable brands within the sport ecosystem. So we are like seeing more and more uh, organizations, companies, brands that are actually focusing on development like sustainable solutions to actually tap into the power of the sport industry to being able to showcase their capabilities and their solutions. So I think that's one of the key 
maybe solutions for me it's to actually showcase the sport industry as an amazing platform for this type of runs to being able to showcase these sustainable products so as we are seeing that i don't know uh like vegan food or this type of uh sustainable products are like getting more and more attention i think they are going to be able to actually utilize the power of sport industry to showcase these specific products so we are going to have more brands within the ecosystem and that's a way to actually uh, the sport organizations to actually uh do not lose like this revenue and money that are for sure is needed. Uh, and for the other, uh, and I think for the first part of the question, and maybe Claire, I can actually go into a bit more detail on this, but I think at the end for this type of controversial uh, type of industries, we need first clear rules. So we need to understand like for federations and for like sport, like 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 for right holders to, to being able to put like specific rules on how these type of industries are able to put some money within the sport industry. We need to understand and to have like better uh, and clear rules on that. And the other part, it's like for consumers and for fans as they are actually holding uh, sport organizations accountable for the sponsors they have. I think little by little, they're going to be able to this is going to be a bit more risky for sport properties to actually sign sponsors that are considered uh, part of controversial industries, I think. Oh, brilliant <laughs> from Antonio. I've, I mean, Erica, we could probably do a whole other 90 minutes on this question. <laughs> so let's think about that. And um, there's loads and loads of different facets to this question. So first of all, as we, first of all, Ideally, sport will start coming away from heavy carbon sponsors as it becomes more committed to the environment. Of course, we want to see that. However, we have to be thoughtful about that. That's really important. Um, for example, if a, a sports organization has an aviation sponsor and then they drop that but take a crypto sponsor on, well, we know that cryptocurrency has a huge energy impact on the environment in terms of mining crypto. So it's not just as simple as get rid of these sponsors and all of a sudden you're great. It's very, very complex. Um, I would shout out my colleague Eileen McManaman, who's on this call. Eileen, share the work you're doing <laughs> on brands because um, Eileen does a huge amount of work in this area and actually starting to look at not just the sponsor itself, but what it's credibly doing in this space, again, to be quite thoughtful about this. Um, and then the last element I'd say is sort of a word, a word to the wise in terms of having these heavy carbon sponsors. We've seen examples of um, pressure to drop them and it can cause more issues. So Tennis Australia were forced to drop their sponsor Santos after just one year of a multi-year deal because um, a grassroots organization, 350.org, petitioned um, and put them under so much pressure, they dropped them. Um, we saw the outcry when British Cycling brought Shell on of people shredding their membership of British Cycling um, and being very vocal about that. So there's a huge amount to talk about. It's not a simple answer in terms of sport, just getting rid of oil and gas sponsors and all of a sudden the problems are solved. So we have to be thoughtful about it. We have to be purposeful about it. But a good place is understanding what your sponsor's stance is on the environment beyond just what sort of organization they are and what they're credibly and purposefully doing to move to a, transit, a sustainable transition in the future. Thank you. Next time we will budget a whole day for this webinar. Thank you, Vitas, for the question and Claire and Antonio. Uh, as we have a few moments left for questions, I'll just encourage folks to try to keep their questions brief, 30 seconds or less, and any panelists' answers. If you can aim for 30 seconds, I know it's almost impossible, but that way we can try to blaze through some of these. Um, I'm going to go to the chat box for one, and then next up I'll invite uh, the person who is SWAM. Uh, but first up, a question from Trina Bolton, amazing sports diplomacy champion in the US right now. She's asking for any examples from any of the panelists and perhaps Niccolo might have some ideas, but any of the panelists, are there examples of how athletes can be key supporters and citizen scientists in this space? Uh, she's wondering if there are any specific champions of sport and sustainability that come to mind in addition to our wonderful panel and perhaps what well-known athletes are most active and effective in this space. So uh, does anyone on the panel have any examples or shout outs to athletes in the world that are in this discussion. I'm happy to jump in Erica, but prioritizing other panelists if they have something to say first, because I've already spoken. 
Go ahead, Claire, and anyone can follow up or type in the chat box. I don't see anyone jumping on my screen, so please jump if uh, you're ready. Otherwise, Claire, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I would just say there's groups. If people are interested in what athletes are doing, look up Athletes of the World, Players for the Planet, Eco Athletes, um, all groups that bring together athletes at different levels and try and support and engage them to be more vocal on climate change. Um, we are trying to get athletes, encourage more athletes to speak out on this topic. And um, the biggest barrier to that is most of them don't feel as though they know enough about the subject to be able to speak about it in a way um, that lands. Um, a great analogy someone said to me um, recently, I think it was Melissa Wilson who heads up Athletes of the World, actually. And she said, you know, we don't need to be oncologists to know that cancer is terrible. And it's a great analogy in terms of we can, you know, we can talk out about an issue that we know is really important important like climate change or the environment without being scientists ourselves because there's so much information out there so we try and encourage athletes to speak out more and if if you're looking for more information on individual names you know from from household names down to more grassroots champions look at athletes of the world players for the planet front runners um, and eco athletes Awesome. And Nicola, I'll pass it to you in just a second if you've got anything. But for anyone in the audience, feel free to type in the chat box. What's your answer to this question? And Trina also invited us to not only think about champion athletes, but also champions who might be CEOs or government reps. So does anyone come to mind? I'd love to know. We'd love to know. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, sorry, I had, pro I had trouble since switching on my mic. Um, surely I can talk about a couple of examples. I know very well because I'm collaborating or I worked with them. So one of them is surely the ocean race. Um, you know that every boat of the ocean race fleet um, is has a built-in system for trapping microplastic throughout their race in the oceans. So this is something that also sports organizations can provide in their events. Yeah, the ocean race is quite a case since they travel the whole ocean and so they do like a, um, a round the globe uh, event. And another case I, I know quite um, closer is the Surfrider Foundation that is promoting many initiatives around coastal erosion and microplastics. And they also need technology, for example, one of very simple devices they implemented. There are many surfers using it in the WSL, that is the professional world tour for surfers, but also for the International Surfing Association, that is the International um, Federation for Surfing. It, those are um, like straps you put on your knees and then you can trap my, microplastics and then you can sample the microplastics in the area. So there are many initiatives. It is very sport dependent and organization dependent, but surely if you uh, check it on the on the on the internet. You can have a, a look at, at this. And lastly, uh, a startup I've been working uh, or collaborating with. Uh, you can you can have a look uh, in got2.eu. That is the 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 project with the IOC I'm developing. Uh, and there is a startup we are collaborating with that is doing a sort of uh, a list of the uh, of the whole projects running in, around uh, sport and uh, citizen science in the world. That startup is out to me. Fantastic. Well, let's go to the two raised hands. I'll invite the person SWAM to unmute first, and then I'll invite the next person, and then we'll have anyone from the panel address both of their questions. We'll see if it works. So go ahead and unmute. Uh, whoever's SWAM, please. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Benny. I'm a CEO founder, Sports the Mission Spam India. First of all, I want to thank all the uh, speaker today. It was brilliant and get a lot of inspiration from everybody. The work they do is amazing work. My question for Antonio. Uh, and also I heard uh, Claire uh, very clearly mentioning about the commitment and the communicating aspect of uh, when you come and work with the environment. That, that's make an impact. But to be sustainable, we need money. So in what way I can, or our organization can uh, uh, do a reporting to show that, yes, it's working. Because this environment, it's, it's kind of a topic which is, uh, you know, like kind of uh, quality aspects of the uh, thing is seen, but not the quantity. So how we can write the report on daily basis. Thank you. Great. Well, before I open it up to the panel, I'd just like to invite Marcos uh, to ask their question, and then we'll see if we can try to address both, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Marcos from Brazil. 
And I'd like to ask to the um, panelists uh, how bicycle uh, tourism uh, can contribute to environmental awareness, the protection actions, please. Okay, just to clarify, Marcos, did you say bicycle tourism? Yes, bicycle okay. Uh, tourism. Okay, interesting. Tourism. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks to Benny and Marcos. I'll repeat the questions and I'll invite anyone from the panel. And even for Benny's question, I know they suggested Antonio and Claire, but I'm also thinking Natasha and Shad about impact reporting and how to demonstrate impact your organizations are probably fabulous at that so um the question from benny from india was about uh the importance of money getting funding to be sustainable and how to prove to funders or to sponsors that this is working and prove that impact so any panelists jump in on that one and then of course marcos's question from brazil super specific how can bicycle tourism contribute to environmental awareness Hi, Erica, I'll jump in. Um, so just based on the previous question as well with the um, athletes and things, there's also an organization called Common Goal. Um, and so with the Common Goal, they have professional uh, football players as well that contribute to the sustainable development goals. And they have to select various topics as well. And there's a few of them on the environmental and um the sustainable 12 or the 13 goals as well. So that one specific. And then on to the question regarding reporting. Um, the way we do it is usually a pre and post, or we use a baseline survey at the beginning. And then depending on the program that we do, it's constant monitoring throughout uh, the rollout of the project to do with the end goal in sight of what we're trying to achieve. And so then just what are the steps and we're working towards it? And then what have we found doing that, whether it was successful, not successful, reevaluating and then continuing. So we do a survey at the beginning, mid survey, and then one at the end as well. And then just the question on the cyclist, we've got a bike trail actually on the corpus as well. So we've got an, um, what a mountain bike trail that goes through and the cyclists, the tourists that come through, they pay a conservation levy. Uh, which contributes again to the research and the conservation preservation of the Walker Bay and the Purpose Foundation as well. So that is how cyclists in our area contribute to the preserving of conservation is going up onto those specific uh, bike trails that is marked out within uh, the nature reserve. Fantastic. Thank you, Tasha. I wasn't sure if anyone could touch on the bicycle question. That's awesome. Um, well, for the sake of time, I would like to ask us to move to closing remarks and I would like to pass it over to Christo in just a second. Uh, John, I saw your hand was also raised. I, I hope we got to your earlier questions in the panel. Um, for anything else, feel free to connect offline. Uh, but for the sake of time and to respect our panelists, I'd like to pass it over to Christo to lead our closing remarks and he'll also invite the panel to share any last thoughts for us today? Great, Erica. Thanks a lot for that. And we've had such a busy afternoon. I made notes for a summary, but you're going to be relieved to know that I'm not going to attempt the summary. I have some closing comments, but I'd like to go to our panelists first. Let's take them in the same order. Um, we have some time limitations, so I'm going to try and respect that. Let's get some concluding comments from each one of our panelists, and then I have some uh, short message at the end. Let's go with Claire first, Claire. Any Hi, comments from you your so side? Much. Thank you, Christo. Yes, yeah, so my hopes to see in the future, I think whilst we've got done a lot of work so far in this area, there's a huge amount to do. So I think my hope for the future is that um, the sustainability in the environment becomes a core part of decision making within, within sports organisations as important as financial <laughs> and other considerations as well. I think if we can make sure that the environment and nature um, and, and the climate crisis are considered through all decision making in sport, then we're going to be a really, really good place so just more coverage more events like this more athletes speaking out more media coverage and more sport taking action 
great. Thank you, Claire. Claire, it was an education listening to you this afternoon. The detail of your knowledge and your insights into environmental matters is a total treat. You also spoke to us about the commonalities of what organizations have in common um, for reducing impact on the environment. And you had uh, a number of things there that's so valuable for all of our organizations. So thanks in particular to you this afternoon. It's been great to have you here. Antonio, let's go with you next. Thank you, uh, Christo. And I think I'm, and it seems that I'm like just like following Claire's, but I totally agree that we need to keep talking about it. We need to keep pushing for sustainability to 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 be to be put within the top of the agenda within the sport industry. I think we're little by little getting there. And, and, and I think the idea is for us to keep pushing for sustainability to become at least the basic standard within the sport industry. And I think having more events like this and having more people getting interested in this is the, 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 key, uh, the key step. And I think we're moving in, in, in the right way. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah, I have not really made the interfaces in my own mind that I did today from, today from listening to you about sponsorship and branding. Um, I think you've really been able to engage with that topic and uh, bring under our attention that even when new partners are brought into the game, that they put themselves under the spotlight and increasingly there's this international uh, transparency and accountability necessary. And it was great having you, Antonio. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our third um, participant or panel member. It's Natasha with her messages to us on youth and the community. Some last comments from your side, Natasha. Thanks, Chris. So, yeah, I would say for anyone who's looking to start programs or run programs within the community to their specific for the area, because the only way that you can make the change is if the, the, the issues are actually within. Um, so not trying to just follow some, um, the sustainable goals, there's quite a few, but if you're just trying to do programs that doesn't benefit the community, it won't be successful. So I think looking from within what the community needs, what um, we can do to preserve the environment that we live in and that we work in would be the first step in developing what is the program that you guys use and the success thereof as well. Great. Thank you, Natasha. A take home for me from what you shared with us is that it's the fun of sport that attracts children for yourselves. And then you teenagers that are engaged become adults, you know, that are responsible in true, true citizenship. So that was a very special message from you today to have the youth and the communities and the importance of, of children um, have such an emphasis, uh, Natasha. Thanks a lot for that. And as Erica said at the time, it's really such a world example of what we can do uh, elsewhere in the world and also globally. So it was absolutely lovely having you here this afternoon. Um, Shad, good to have you with us as well. Generations of Peace, a last comment from your side. Uh, so I'd like to highlight that um, like there are several areas of work that can be done to drive action on the sports and environment, and one of which is research, where we can conduct more research on the environmental impact of sports events and activities. And we can also uh, um, influence policy, so to develop and implement policies and guidelines for uh, sports organizations and events to minimize their environmental impact. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, Shard. Shard, you really um, argued for bottom-up change, and you said to us at the end that change comes from within, and that we need to include youth in communities in our programming. And so your contribution also today, very special to us. Thank you for being here um, and for educating us in the Jordanian um, approach. Um, Nicolo, you are the last one. Would you like to share your message with us? Um, perhaps just some closing comments. Uh, the message is to keep the, the, the disease in enthusiasm alive. I mean, this is what is really, uh, really pushing us forward and uh, uh, pushing our actions because the, uh, our common shared goal is uh, hard. We have to recognize this, but what we need, we really need uh, our um, our strength is the enthusiasm. So this is my <laughs> final take-home and invitation message for everybody joining. 
Thank you, Nicolo. You were the last speaker, but as Erica said at the time, you actually closed for us very nicely because you were pulling together a number of such important topics for us, the issues around science, science and the democracy, but also citizen sport science, um, you know, in combination. So thank you for adding that value, uh, Nicolo, to uh, what we've been busy with here this afternoon. From my side, um, I'm just so inspired by um, the 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 quality of the young professionals that I've seen here this afternoon on the panel, but also amongst our participants, and that is so encouraging um, uh, for somebody like myself. I'm also so impressed with all of the bottom-up initiatives that we are busy with. Um, there is this book written by Schelling in the United States, Micromotives and Macro Behavior. And Schelling argued, Schelling argued if there's enough micromotives and enough happening at the micro level that it has, uh, you know, larger implications and that it changes into macro behavior. So I'm very impressed with the bottom-up initiatives that we've seen. From my side, I happen to believe that we need to go bottom-up and top-down. I would like to see NOCs and international federations and all of our national federations embrace environment big time. We need to see them having sustainability policies and climate change strategies, and we need them to see that they sign the climate action change framework. You can um, uh, put me up in the papers tomorrow. I hope I don't get into trouble, but I think it's fewer than 25 NOCs, National Olympic Committees, of the 206 that we have that have actually signed the climate uh, change action framework thus far. So we also have this collective responsibility uh, to be pushing the formal organizations, our sport bodies that have policy to move at the, their levels as important as the bottom-up initiatives are. Ladies and gentlemen, from my side, my last comment is to say a big thank you to Erica. She has arranged this whole afternoon and this webinar. She did so well at facilitating it with the panel members and also the participants. Erica, well done to you and thank you so much for doing so well this afternoon and giving all of us a chance and I'm going to pass over to you for the final conclusion and closure. Thank you, everybody. It was absolutely lovely to spend the time with you this afternoon and our priorities going forward. Thank you. Cheers, Christo. Excellent summaries. I love those pieces you picked up on. Uh, really, really quick closing from me. I just want to echo what Christo said. I'm just so pleased with all of the contributions from our expert panel. You each brought such diversity and such expertise from geography to your own identity, your lived experience, and of course, the work that you're doing. It was so dynamic and so inspiring. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to the audience for attending. We had over 110 participants the first hour and the next 40 minutes, we're still going strong over 80 participants. Thank you for everyone for staying so engaged in this key conversation. Finally, special and important thank you to Paul Hunt from Sport and Dev for making this possible. Special thank you to the Swedish Postcode Foundation for their support of this spotlight. Special thank you to Adele Brueggemann for helping with the technology, making sure we made it today, as well as Tarika Tandon and Haresh Diol for reviewing article submissions related to this spotlight. It's been a pleasure, everyone. Please stay engaged with everyone from this call, from this session, and feel free to keep watching and keep engaging with sportindev.org. Thank you so much. Right, thank you, Erika. Thank you, everybody.